all right all right cool so yeah as always uh, i wanted to do a second live we just did one yesterday that one is uploaded on youtube if you are interested in checking it out the link is in the bio so you can find it anytime you want yeah we're just uh, going to do uh, 20 conscious breaths and it's going to take about two three minutes but if you want to join me uh, join me i know your time is important but i think this is important because it gets me started uh, and it gets us started to be honest on the same page where you're thinking a little bit more clearly a little bit more calmly so i'm going to count to 20 um, i'm going to do 20 breaths and you can do the same the way i do it if you are joining for the first time is I run my thumb across the tips and the grooves of my fingers. So I just use my thumb to count. So you can see one, two, three, four. So that's four on each finger, that's 16. Then 17, 18, 19, that's 19. And then I count one for the whole hand. So that's uh, 20 breaths without psychological counting. So that's just a, a trick. If you don't want to meditate, that's great. Uh, click on the Click on the question mark icon on the lower part of your screen and type in some questions and we'll go through them. I'm back. Is this going to be on live for the rest of the time? No, I don't intend to keep you guys here for one hour or whatever we are going to do it, do this one for. So let's see. We have some questions. Um, wow, some big questions right off. Um, let's take this one. We have be, I, we talk about surrender. I talk about surrender a lot on the page, and we, we refer to it at least touch upon it in uh, every single live that I do. So let's go into it. What does it mean to surrender and to let go? So uh, surrender is the most, if not one of the most difficult ideas to understand. Um, and the interesting thing about it is, even if we understand the idea of surrender, 
that doesn't necessarily mean that we can do it okay because to surrender is to suspend all effort that is what is hidden in that word surrender and most of us approach this word or other techniques in meditation with the idea of doing something about them what can i do to solve my life's problems i am going to learn meditation i am going to learn uh, um how to be present all the time i am going to read so and so's book i am going to practice so and so technique we are always doing 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 see we are always moving in the direction such that whatever effort we put in gives us in return some progress towards our goal whatever that goal is surrender doesn't work like that okay it's uh, it is the abandoning of effort which is surrender so it's a it's a concept which is completely reverse of what we have been doing it is a complete undoing of all our conditioning until now in life because our condition is to resist our condition is to fight our condition is to ask for things and to do things such that we get something in return to surrender is to understand that no matter what i can do in this moment it is not going to give me the result what i want okay so to come naturally to a point where anything more we put in seems fruitless or seems meaningless and which is why this is a difficult concept to grasp because to most people that means uh, to hit the rock bottom and you cannot hit rock bottom uh, consciously rock bottom is hit when you try everything there is to try and then there is nothing more left to try and that is when you hit rock bottom and so surrender is not something eventually you can do it is only something you can understand once you understand the concept once you grasp the concept naturally at some point in your self awakening journey in your self awareness journey you are going to realize that all effort all methods all techniques all desire to change oneself at some point hits its natural end they all have their limitations and beyond a certain point there is nothing for you to do you see there is nothing for you to do when you hit that point when you realize there is nothing more for you to do that is surrender and uh, it is the most powerful experience that you will have in your life undoubtedly whoever has gone through it um, knows about it very well and uh, you just give up fighting after that uh, just giving up fighting doesn't mean that you stop working on yourself it just means that whatever work you put in it's not in the way of resistance it's not fighting against yourself you are no longer standing in your own way uh, that doesn't mean there is no path in front of you so if there is a goal i want to achieve in life that doesn't mean the goal disappears the goal is still there but now i'm no longer working against myself as i move towards that goal because i have surrendered and so that's what surrender means um that's what letting go means too um even though lots of spiritual teachers um out there i won't take any names uh, even including myself actually we talk about letting go uh, at the back of their minds if they are being honest they know that you can't really let go letting go is an action which is not natural to human beings the action which is natural to human beings is holding on and so you're asking people to let go when their natural conditioning everything that they have done so far in life has taught them to hold on how are they going to let go so people let go when they can no longer hold on and when it happens for the first time it is going to be accidental but when it happens the first time that is when one truly understands what it means to let go and then then it becomes a practice then you can consciously let go too because you once you do it once then your mind can learn how to do it again i was talking about this yesterday it's like riding a bicycle the first time we learned it remember how hard it was to learn it for the first time you kept falling kept falling if you remember as kids when you first time learned how to ride a bike or you can watch your kids if you have them learning how to ride a bike you only need to get a glimpse of how to keep that balance the instant your brain gets it what that balance is then everything is easy then it just goes very very fast um then one day you learn how to balance and two days later you are going down the street at you know 
five miles an hour or ten miles an hour. Um, but just two days before, you couldn't even you couldn't even sit on the bike, and so it's kind of like that. Until you understand what surrender and letting go is, it's going to be a struggle. But don't give up, because at some point, all your efforts are going to culminate to a point where you don't give up, but you give in. That is, you stop fighting, and that is when you will know what it means to surrender. And so it's your experience. It's not. me telling you or somebody else telling you how to surrender it's not going to make sense at all it is your own discovery uh, which you have to come to naturally so i hope that makes sense let's see if there is any other questions a bunch of them so let's see how to stop making someone's behavior decisions about me if he doesn't do this uh, exactly so is there more to that question i think that's it right so <clears throat> how to not make someone's decisions or behavior not about me so let's look at this question when people are making decisions about you or in regards to your relationship with them they are making decisions based on how they see you okay and you are making decisions based on how you see them so i'm going to talk about this in the book i'm writing right now but we usually don't interact with people we interact with an image we have of other people what that means is there is a historical memory which we use and using that memory of using all the interactions we have had about that person we create an image about that person and based on that image we are talking to those people based on our understanding of who they are because this image is always standing between us and them and so when they are making a decision about you or when they are making decisions in a relationship in which you are with them they are also looking at you through that lens which is your past behavior and so we always come to a point where we feel as if we are being judged we always feel as if it is about us personally but we have to understand that it is never really about who we are because who we are is revealed in the moment okay who we are is not revealed over a period of time who we are is revealed from moment to moment to moment to moment so whenever you are talking to someone uh, whether it's your partner or your loved one if you can talk to them completely by being present okay which is you are so present that you are listening to them with everything that you have you are listening to them not just with your ears but you are listening to them with your whole being your whole mind is listening to them there is no distraction the only thing that matters is that person and the words they are saying in that moment if we can have that kind of a communication with someone then the image we have of those people the the history the past we have about those people doesn't come into being it doesn't evoke itself and so whatever you speak however you connect with that person that connection is seamless and in that connection there is no conflict between two people because even if somebody gets angry the connection is so strong that the anger dissolves or you know exactly what to say or how to react and so when people are making decisions about you you have to understand that they are not making a decision about you but a decision about who they think you are so if they approach you in that sense that is they are talking to you in the sense of what you have done in the past how your reactions have been in the past if you have not lived up to your word in the past and they are holding it against you and you can see that in every conversation you are having with them be present be so fully present that they are forced to be in the present too because when you connect with someone that's the beauty of listening fully that's the beauty of being there being present in any any relationship when you're when you're communicating with someone is that it doesn't matter if they are not listening to you the only thing that matters to you that you listen to them and in such a relationship in such an interaction you never find that you enter a conflict with another person so even if they say something which is judgmental even if they say something which is hurtful it never affects you because you can instantly process it you're there all your mental faculties are present you're 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 already present in the moment 
And so you respond to them correctly. You don't get angry when they judge you or when they say something hurtful, but you respond to it correctly such that they take their, take their words back or they apologize or they are not able to bring even those hurtful things which they are about to say because of how beautifully you are listening to them. And so develop that way of interacting with people where you are intently listening to them, being in the present moment. Because if you don't do that, then you are going to be caught up in other people's judgments and you are going to make it about you. So if you don't want to make it about you, be present and then it will never be about you. It will always be about that present moment. I kind of give long answers. I don't know if they make sense to you guys. If they do, um, let me know. The quick question I look at here. What do you think of committing to practice? Example, prayer or meditation? It feels like we do it to have control, which does not help with the flow. Krishnamurti says it's a form of control. Uh, exactly, which is what I said about when I answered the first question. Uh, all these methods and techniques at the end of the day, they are our means of feeling in control. They are our way of saying, hey, I can do something about this. Let me try and do it my way. Let me try and learn these 100 meditation techniques. Let me get up at 5 a.m. in the morning and do so and so. Those things are good and you should not stop doing them. But have this idea at the back of your mind that at some point you are going to see that they don't really work. And that's what he's saying when, when he says that they don't help. Uh, these techniques don't help. They help in the short run, but in the long run they don't help. Because in the long run, you hit a point which you must transcend. You hit a point where you realize that none of this works. None of this works, no matter how hard you try. And when you hit that point, or wh every person hits that point at some, at some point in their lives, after that point, there is no effort. After that point, there is no struggle. After that point, there is no self-protection. Um, after that point, there is intuition which takes over. See, control falls apart and intuition takes over, which is you do things because you feel a certain inclination, a certain force tells you that you must do something. And um, when you learn to follow your intuition, everything seems to work out just fine. So I hope that clears that question. So we're talking about intuition. So let's look at this question. How to make better choices naturally? So first we have to understand what it means to make a decision, to make a choice, okay? When we are thinking of making a decision in our life, isn't it that we are choosing between different ways, okay? We are choosing between, should I accept this job? Should I not accept this job? Should I leave my current job? Should I work on something that I love to do? Should I write a book? Should I do this? Should I do that? These are all choices, see? And then we are confused about which choice to pick. Um, having to pick out of these choices implies that currently we are confused. And that is why we have so many choices, see? Uh, most people feel that choice is a way of expressing their freedom. Choice is not freedom. Choice is confusion. Um, if you were free, if we were free to think correctly, then we would have only one choice in front of us. That one choice would be the thing which we want to do next. Because we don't have clarity, we are stuck with choice. And so understand that aspect first, that if you see a hundred different choices in front of you, that just means you are not clear. And it's okay. There's nothing to be worried about that. If you go to... Um, if you go for shopping and you look, you want to buy a toothbrush and you see a hundred different brands of toothbrush over there. Yes, at that level, you must make a choice. In, in the mechanistic form of what life is, in your daily small decisions, there is always a lot of information that will be thrown at you and you have to pick and choose the information which you, which you are going to act on. So in that sense, you will always have different choices. But... Those are trivial choices. Those are very small things. We are talking about how to make big life decisions, right? That's when, that's when making better decisions really matters. 
is how to make correct life decisions to make correct life decisions you must first understand your life you must first understand yourself you must first understand how you think about problems and how you have approached problems in the past you must understand your likes your dislikes your fears your desires your pleasures you must understand all of it when you understand all of it and then a problem arises which presents to you different choices in front of you then you pick out the choice that you want right away then you zoom in on the answer then you zone in on the answer instantly because you are in the present moment see you are not confused you are not trying to decide which one to pick but you are simply looking inward and because you are in tune with yourself with your inner condition an external situation which becomes uh, <clears throat> which becomes symbiotic with your internal state you immediately identify that you meet a certain person and you say that person's energy matches with my energy their their vibe matches with my vibe and so you st- want to immediately talk to them so that is another way of looking at intuition coming back the whole circle so when you are in tune with yourself when you understand yourself deeply your choices will be based on intuition and those choices will always be correct those choices will not lead to regret later on once you have made the choice because you will know that i made that choice in that state of mind which was correct for that time and even if that choice doesn't turn out okay at this point it is still not going to cause me guilt right and so you are always comfortable with the choices you make in your life if you are uh, deeply evaluating yourself not the choices but evaluating yourself and based on that evaluation you directly pick out the thing you want to do so i hope that helps long answers are perfect thank you so so hey buddy um i don't know how to say your first name but thanks for joining the live i know you wanted to join this one can you please share more about how you addressed your lack of self confidence i don't know for whatever reason i don't see the whole question lack of self confidence which you experience etc etc so i will just say how do how did i address lack of self confidence um that's an important uh, important question because when we talk about having low self esteem or low confidence or being in a situation where we feel insecure we look at other people who are more confident who are more secure etc or we read books about how to be more secure and these books immediately put us in conflict with our present state of mind right they immediately say oh are you feel do you not have confidence then what you should do is go and talk to more people but hey talking to more people is what makes me uncomfortable so you are asking me to do the thing which makes me uncomfortable how can i even how can i ever do that that seems like really ridiculous advice which it is if you really think about it because when we are insecure we cannot act in a way which is secure so to pretend security is not security which is what most techniques will ask you to do pretend that you are secure pretend that you can talk to other people go and stand if there is a bunch of people talking among themselves at a at a party go and insert yourself into into that situation go and mingle with people of course not that's not how you become secure that's not how you build self confidence that's how you ruin you whatever existing self confidence you have because you're approaching that situation with um insecurity and your insecure energy is going to be picked up by people and they are going to say something which are going to make it about yourself you're when you listen you are going to feel as if they are talking about you that makes you more insecure and that further destroys your self confidence um so what to do right that's the question what should i do if i do not have self confidence the way i got over my self confidence uh, self confidence issues and i had plenty of them you know honest to god is that i focused really deeply on understanding myself understanding the patterns of thought which i have okay understanding what have i been thinking since the morning how am i approaching any day 
which begins? Do I begin with fear? Do I begin with hesitation? Do I begin with negative thoughts? Do I project my negativity on other people? Do I project, do I constantly look for situations which suggest that I'm not good enough? Am I doing those things? Look at that mental dialogue. Understand your mental dialogue because when you understand yourself, when you understand how your fears are operating from day to day, when you understand how your pleasures are operating from day to day, how you seek out pleasure and how you avoid difficult situations, just be aware. Don't try to change anything. This is the easy part because all you have to do is just be aware. They, immediately when we see something negative about us, we want to change it. Don't change it. I'm not asking you to change yourself. I'm only asking you to observe yourself. So when you observe yourself more and more and more, you start becoming self-aware and you start developing self-understanding. Now, how does self-understanding relate to self-confidence? Okay. What is lack of self-confidence? It is to feel as if you cannot deal with the challenge that is given to you. It is to lack trust in yourself. And when do you lack trust in yourself? When you don't know who you are or what you are. Self-understanding makes you realize who you are, what you are. You see, when you know yourself, then you can trust yourself. If you don't even know yourself, how can you trust yourself? Because you haven't defined what yourself is. And most people go through their entire lives this way. They do not know who they are and they are trying to find self-confidence. You can't find self-confidence if you don't know your weaknesses. You can't find self-confidence if you don't know how your thinking goes wrong. Right? You can't find self-confidence unless you deeply, deeply know yourself. So instead of putting yourself in uncomfortable situations, instead of saying, I want to read a hundred different books, observe your mental patterns, observe yourself, understand yourself deeply. Because when you understand yourself, you will understand other people. And when you understand other people, you will feel as if you can read their minds, directly understand what they are thinking before they even open their mouths to say the next thing they want to say. And so when you understand people in that way, there is no way you won't have self-confidence. There is no way you won't have confidence in any given situation because you will understand any given situation. You will understand the people involved in each situation. You will understand each interaction better. And so increase your self-knowledge. And that's the only permanent cure to insecurity. How long does it take? If that's your question, how long have you got? That's my question. So begin first and see the changes you changes you go through um, they will be pretty fast they will be pretty fast and uh, the other thing is you can practice an art form which makes you feel uh, more engaged with yourself i practice i have too many hobbies i practice uh, martial arts and been doing it for eight nine years now so it's one of the things I'd never post any videos, but it's one of the things which I deeply, deeply enjoy doing. It's one of my hobbies, one of my passions. Um, so do things which you know that will build up your self-confidence. So I did not take up martial arts because that would build up my self-confidence. But I realized that it did build up my confidence even more, um, even though that was not my intention for picking up the art. So pick up a, an art form. Um, because when you have an art form, you can talk about it to other, with other people. You have something to share which other people don't know about. And that also builds up your confidence. Hey, I know something which I can tell people. So that's also a good thing. So work on all these aspects, not just one aspect. Yes, knowing your weaknesses increases your self-confidence. Why? Because, hold up, my screen is going haywire. Um, why does knowing your weakness increase self-confidence? Because when you know your weaknesses and you're not trying to change them, that means you have got a real shot of going beyond your weaknesses. Uh, that means that you know situations which you don't want to take on because you know that you're not good at them. For example, if you're not good at um, technical thinking, let's say technical stuff, you won't go out and pick out a job which forces you to think technically. You would say, I want to pick out a job which doesn't force me to do that which I'm not good at. And so now you have avoided a whole host of issues, right? Uh, you have avoided a whole lot of embarrassing and uncomfortable situations because you made a decision 
to not move in the direction where you know that you are weak. Um, now, this doesn't mean you don't work on yourself. It just means that that is not a part of your personality. See, uh, we are not talking about uh, we are not talking about ignoring your weaknesses. We are only talking about acknowledging your weaknesses and accepting challenges which we know we can deal with. And so that you have to develop a high degree of sensitivity uh, for that to happen. <clears throat> How can you do shadow work? So let me address that quickly. I think I understand where that word comes from. Um, shadow work is basically things you do by yourself, uh, for yourself, uh, when nobody is watching. I always like to say, when you no longer fear the person you become when nobody is watching, that is when you have started to integrate with yourself. See, because we are always afraid of who we become. We are always afraid of our fears, our guilt, uh, all kinds of negative emotions coming up when we are alone. Uh, sometimes we are afraid of um, unhealthy desires taking over our mind. So all of it, all of it is something which we don't want in ourselves, right? We are rejecting that part of ourselves. So the first step in any kind of shadow work, for me at least, is acknowledging and accepting that part of who we are, which is not fighting against that part. Even though we have some really bad habits, not fighting against those bad habits, right? If you resist those bad habits, they only become stronger. You have to let them act themselves out. That is how they will leave your system. And on the side, keep working on developing the good habits. So first thing about shadow work is um, you have to face yourself and you have to accept yourself. And you have to come to a point where you no longer resist who you are. So let's see if there's any other questions. I see there's a lot of questions, sorry. Um, so this is an important question which I haven't addressed so far. So let's talk about this. My throat is running dry. How long do we have? Right, 25 minutes. Let's see. Addictions, moving away from addictions. So. This is a very serious issue. Um, so firstly, if you have substance addiction problems, this is not the place to address them, okay? So you have to seek medical guidance appropriately as, as you should. Everything that we are discussing is not, got nothing to do with uh, medical advice or expert advice. We're just talking as friends. So let's talk as friends what addictions mean and how to move away, away from addictions. Um, when it comes to addictions, why do we get so trapped in them? Okay. You have to understand that how the brain works when it comes to an addiction is the brain releases a chemical called as dopamine. Okay. Not to get too technical, but this dopamine makes us feel a rush, makes us feel uh, an urge to move towards that particular thing which is going to give us a release, whether it's uh, sexual addictions or whether it's smoking a cigarette or whether it's any other kind of substance it is that release of gradual pleasure of dopamine which we have to be aware of because we are not really addicted to the act okay when we get when we are addicted to the act or when we are addicted to the substance when we imagine that we are addicted to the substance or addicted to the act we just become more and more guilty we just feel more and more guilt Oh, I have an addiction. Oh, I need to work on myself. Oh, I'm never going to be uh, coming out of this problem because this addiction is always following me like a shadow. We have to understand that it is not the substance or the act we are addicted to, but it is a mental process. Okay, It is a mental and a brain, a chemical process, which is what the brain is addicted to. The brain couldn't care less what the substance is. The brain couldn't care less. I mean, the substance addictions become severe later on because the, now the body starts craving them. But it's, um, we are talking about a stage where your brain is getting addicted to things. So all these pleasures we seek, which become the reasons for our, our addictions, those things are not to be worried about. So don't label them and say, I'm addicted to 100 different things. But first understand that it is a, is, it's a chemical process that the brain relies upon, okay, in order to avoid facing 
whatever problems or whatever situations it is going through once you understand that immediately the guilt begins begin, begins to reduce doesn't it the guilt is the first thing you need to address because when you are guilty when you are constantly putting yourself down for having those addictions i guarantee that you are not going to do any work on them and even when you do any work on them it's going to come out of a place of constant conflict and the conflict only feeds the addiction because every time you say i must not do that thing okay you need to tell your brain what that thing is correct every single time you tell your brain i must not do that thing i must not smoke a cigarette i must not smoke a cigarette the word cigarette 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 is constantly repeating in your brain so whatever thing that you are trying to break away from you are repeating that particular object of your addiction more and more as you resist it and as you resist it it becomes stronger and then we complain saying oh my god my addictions are not getting any better they only have gotten worse in the past year of course because you are fighting against them what is is going to happen when you fight against something it's going to get stronger and it is using your energy to get stronger that brings us to what to do about them okay the only thing that breaks addictions completely destroys addictions absolutely is the act of surrender okay now it i call it the act of surrender but it is really an event it is not really an act once you go through that event however you approach it however you come through it sometimes it is forced by circumstances sometimes on can voluntarily come to it however that happens you will stop fighting your addiction from that point onwards okay you will stop saying i should not be doing this because what has it ever gotten you what has i shouldn't be doing this addiction gotten you this got in your addiction right what else has it gotten you so when you say that i am no longer going to fight this i am no longer going to inwardly resist this addiction it must bring a lot of fear okay if it brings up fear the thought of not fighting back against your addiction if that doesn't bring fear in you then you are not understanding what i'm saying if it brings a lot of fear in you then you are standing at the precipice of surrender okay then you are standing right at the edge because that fear is what you must go over that fear is what you must go beyond we feel as if we are going to fall off that precipice once we surrender we are going to collapse we are going to come crashing down that's what we feel okay but only those who jump off know that you don't fall off you basically land on the ground the ground was always a couple of inches beneath your feet anyway but you kept imagining that you're standing on a cliff and that is the fear you have when you stop fighting against your addiction what is going to happen is your addiction is stop is going to stop becoming stronger and stronger okay imagine you're driving a car but you want to bring it to a stop without pushing the brake okay you want to bring the car to a stop but you don't want to brake and there is a free road ahead of you there's nobody in front of you how would you bring a car to stop you just take your leg off the accelerator and you just sit quietly wouldn't you that is kind of what surrender is does it mean the car is going to come to a screeching halt it's not does it mean that your addictions are going to disappear in two days they are not but what is going to happen is all the mental addictive patterns are going to start winding down because you stopped giving them your energy you stopped fighting back against them and so they are going to start winding down and so depending on the severity of your addiction it may take one week two weeks three weeks four weeks one month two months it doesn't matter however long it takes it doesn't matter it matters only when you have not surrendered see if you don't surrender then it matters how long it takes for the addiction to go away but if you have surrendered it won't matter to you whether the addiction stays or it goes it wouldn't matter to you at all and that is what surrender brings to you it brings you complete freedom from your addiction at moment zero at the instant you surrender you will be free from it because you have stopped fighting it and i have some experience with addictions even though uh, i will not brag about them i don't want to bring them up because i know my family watches uh, these uh, live casts so i have had severe addictions and i have come out of them i have also had a family member in my very somebody very close to me with an addiction for many many years okay many years decades 
and I was able to talk to them and their addiction went away. This was three years ago and they are clean. They haven't, they haven't gone back to the substance uh, with which they were addicted. So there is change and change is possible. Uh, it always happens when you approach it the correct way. So find the correct way of approaching, the, approaching your addiction and that is through the path of surrender. Let's see if we can answer any more questions. Are you guys having a good time? Is that making sense to you still? So let's look at Ken's question. Do you recommend meditating daily? If so, for how long? It depends on how deep your problems are, buddy. Uh, or Sorry, I don't know if you're a girl or a guy. Uh, but anyway, it depends on how severe your problems are. If your problems are severe, you have to meditate as long as it takes to um, understand them and release them. There was a time when I was meditating seven hours a day and uh, six, seven hours easily. Uh, it went on for three, four years maybe. On weekends, I would meditate for six to seven hours, just not move from the place. Or I would pick up a book and um, I would read parts of the book, put it down, meditate pick up parts of the book, read again, meditate, and it went on for a long, long time. So I cannot even imagine how long I meditate. And I've been meditating since I was a, I was about 10, 10 years old. So my dad taught me in whatever way he could uh, when I was a child. So meditation has been a part of my life for a long, long time. Uh, so I recommend meditating daily. Yes, absolutely. But don't make a problem out of it, okay? Uh, do it as much as you feel uh, you can and uh, let go if you can't if you feel like meditation is too much then uh, let go of it don't make anything a problem so let's uh, look at ken's question sorry i went on a tangent over there i want a connection with others but i don't feel it i really want a connection with myself but but lack motivation so So what does it mean to connect with somebody? Okay, Most of us have this romantic idea that when I have a connection with someone, it's going to be like I have these beautiful conversations with them. We are going to intellectually connect with each other. We are going to spiritually connect with each other and have these long, beautiful um, uh, conversations for many, many hours, many, many days and so on. Long friendships and whatever, whatnot. Is that what a connection is or is that a romantic notion of what a connection is? What it really means to connect with somebody. Let's understand that. When do you connect with someone? Okay. Do you connect with someone in the past? Absolutely not. That is gone, right? The past is dead. It's done with. Do you connect with somebody in the future? That I will connect with so and so person when I meet them. Do you connect with someone in the future? That's also imagination. That's also projection because you're going to approach it with some ideas of what connection means. And then you're going to mess it up because you're trying to fit a dynamic, evolving, real life situation with your presumption of what connection should be. So you talk to a, a, a girl or a guy and you feel like I must connect to you at a spiritual level. But they are talking about something uh, completely pedestrian. Let's say they are talking about something funny. And they saw yesterday um, about a, a, comedy, a comedy show or a sitcom they saw and they're sharing a joke with you and you're saying, I want to connect with them spiritually. See, now you're approaching your present moment with an ideal which is not real. See, ideals are not real. Ideals are your projection, your imagination. So what it means to connect with somebody is to fully listen to them in that moment. Whatever that moment becomes, whatever that moment evolves into, you are there and you are flowering with them in that moment. If you can do it even for one second, that is true connection. If you can repeat those moments over and over again, that becomes a deep connection over a period of time. Not a projection of what, what it means to have a relationship with someone, but an evolution of that relationship. You see, you want, to, you want the relationship to evolve organically, not 
using an idea of how it should be but seeing what it can be and letting it take shape on its own that is the most important and the most beautiful part about this it's because we are not approaching anything with an idea we are approaching it with openness see we don't come with a closed mind an idea is a closed mind connection is listening beautiful uh thank you michel connection is listening that's exactly what it is so you approach something with a closed mind you can't connect with anybody you approach them with an open mind and you say let's see what this moment shows me and you will connect with them and i cannot tell you how many times the most difficult people in your life who you are afraid of even interacting will become a part of a beautiful connection you have with them it happens to me all the time because um there are people i know i won't i won't tell you who they are but there are people in my life who i have known for a while at work etc etc and they are difficult to work with but when i listen to them when i connect with them it becomes beautiful it becomes seamless no matter what interaction you have with whoever it becomes completely seamless so if you want to have a connection with somebody or with yourself listen to yourself the same way listen to yourself deeply which is observe yourself deeply observe somebody as deeply listen to all the sounds in your environment connect with the environment deeply and you connect and you will feel a connection with nature if you just go into the forest go into the woods and you listen to the sounds of the birds you listen to what what's going on around you and you will start to feel a connection with nature so you can connect the moment you start paying attention so connection is presence that's correct too so i hope that helps uh so that's that let's see what else do we have oh we have 10 more minutes after that the live is going to shut down accepting monitoring minor indication trying to see um how do you have connection with others who choose suffering it doesn't matter what they choose that's the whole point it matters what you choose not what they choose because if you choose not to suffer they will eventually join you and you don't have to expect them to join you but they eventually will join you and they will see that you are not suffering and they will ask you what are you doing to not suffer so um let's see adam's question thanks adam for posting it here because i can't read your question over uh, in the in the thing accepting wandering mind versus indulging and identifying with the wandering thoughts so are you asking how to accept a mind that is wandering coming back to the moment as a rejection and resistance to wandering mind so all right i get i get it i get your question so adam's question is um when our mind basically starts wandering why should we bring it back to the present moment okay isn't that isn't that a conflict we are creating that the mind wants to wander but we are forcing it back to the present moment that's the question essentially right um exactly so you are right on that when your mind is wandering and you are forcing your mind to concentrate on something that is in a form of that is a form of control that is a form of introducing um contradiction conflict in your mind you have to understand something that your preference is to be in the present moment let's say you want to meditate so your preference is to be here and observe your thoughts but if your thoughts are all over the place okay then what is the point of bringing your thoughts to a certain point follow the thoughts because that's what your intention was all along so see how the mind is wandering instead of trying to coerce it in a certain way instead of trying to make it think a particular thing watch what it is thinking and be okay with whatever it is thinking when you become okay with whatever the mind wants to do you will realize the mind doesn't want to do all that much it will become quiet when you fully allow the wandering the mind will not want to wander it wanders only because you want to force it to sit down in one place um remember everything that is happening um if it is imbalanced there is always a force which we are applying
okay in the opposite direction so anytime there is fear you have to understand that there is a reverse force you are applying to not be afraid anytime there is anger there is always a fear there is always a force inside which is saying don't get angry don't get angry don't get angry and the anger begins to build up every action has an equal and opposite reaction so whatever you don't want from life life has a tendency to give it to you okay so that's what you have to understand here that every time there is resistance the thing which you are resisting is going to get stronger and so we have in a sense we have no option but to surrender because only surrender opens up the possibilities otherwise it's a set future we are looking at and it's a future we have decided for ourselves by resisting it meditation can be a beautiful practice but it can also be another egoic pattern somebody has commented absolutely true uh is there any more questions do you have a guide to help to get to know oneself yes uh, i'm writing a book right now so i would say that can act as a guide uh, it's just uh, it's just designed to uh, make the reader observe their own mind and go deeper and deeper into understanding themselves at least that's what my intention is so if it makes a lot of sense uh, you can read that but i don't have any other guides apart from these lives i'm doing and apart from the posts that i'm putting out uh read the descriptions in the post and they are trying to put forward a consistent idea of of how to know oneself let's see how much time we have we have about 3 4 minutes any other questions no i think everybody is um can you please save this live yes it is going to be saved i'm recording it right now so it's going to be saved and it's going to be put up on youtube and i will put links to the questions so you can look at the description click on the question you want and jump to that question instead of hearing me ramble on about other things which you're not interested in when is my book done that's a very good question i am trying my best to finish it in the next couple of months but it's gotten quite long it's going to be close to 140 pages 150 pages um hopefully i can keep it shorter but it's getting quite long i had a question about discipline what's your question oh there was a question about depression which i missed so let's take let's look at this question quickly because this is important stuff um what about depression so firstly again depression is a serious issue and if you have medical concerns always talk to a qualified person do not talk to people on the internet i pray to you um having said that even those people who have qualifications on the internet you shouldn't talk to them on the internet you talk to them in a legal uh, proper setting where they can help you with the de- with clinical depression um uh, now talking as friends as i say can we discuss depression a little bit let's see we have 4 minutes you have to understand something about um depression in the sense that apart from being you know all the research that has gone into it etc etc there are certain times in our life when we will be depressed and we will feel sad the best thing i can advise about it is instead of trying to get rid of depression okay which is what most people do they want to get rid of depression and then so they run and try go on vacations do this that engage in substances to escape the the deep vacuum or the deep chasm they are feeling instead i would say develop the courage to go deeper into that depression okay without of course um being constant constantly aware whether you're having thoughts of harming yourself you know if you're having thoughts of harming yourself obviously you have to immediately consult a professional but as long as you can maintain that distance between uh going falling into depression but floating with it so go float with it flow with your depression even if you are feeling really sad acknowledge the fact that now i'm feeling very very sad and go with that feeling don't fight that feeling i was reading a children's book um 
for my son who is two and a half years old. And it's a story about, uh, uh, it's called a grumpy monkey. It's a, it's a monkey who is sad and he is, uh, all of his friends are trying to cheer him up and they keep trying to cheering up, cheering him up, but he doesn't cheer up because it's always a conflict. Um, they are saying, you should be happy, do this, try this, try that. And they tell him jokes, but he doesn't, he doesn't come out of it because he's feeling that funk. On the last page of the book, I don't want to give it away, but last page of the book, he says, all right, it is, I'm feeling sad and it's okay. And the moment he acknowledges that, that it is okay to feel sad, it is okay to be depressed, that is when he starts to come out of depression. So understand this principle, follow this principle and imbibe, embody this principle that whatever you fight is going to get stronger. If it is your fear, if it is your desire, if it is your depression, whatever you fight becomes stronger. Whatever you accept becomes weaker and whatever you surrender to becomes the reason for your transformation. So I would say that's it. Thank you all and thank you for being here and I love you guys so much. We'll see you next time.